This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. We're now going to go through and look at the world of group account. It's a fundamentally important part of the exam. Uh, it makes up at least 35 marks of question number one. Remember, question number one is compulsory. So you do really need to spend a little bit of time not just mastering the techniques that you get from P2, but also ensuring that you have a fundamental knowledge of what you've seen previously at your F7 level. So that's where we're going to go through and begin to start things off. Yeah, this chapter here is all about looking at basic group structures. It goes through and recaps what you've seen from F7 with regards to the statement of financial position, the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income of a group by looking at a simple group structure whereby we have a parent, we have a subsidiary, and then we have an associate that just sits there just outside of the group. So it's important that you really do grasp a good understanding of what we're about to go through and revise so that you can then get better and improve as you move on to the more complex aspects of group accounts within P2. Okay, so, so do spend a little bit of time uh, on this chapter, ensuring that you're happy with the basics. Okay, uh, so what have we got? Uh, well, we need to go through there and look at what defines a subsidiary. We also need to go through there and look at what defines an associate. Uh, so remember, when you have there, is it your subsidiary? A subsidiary is whereby we have control, isn't it? Okay, so we have the control, uh, which gives us, wasn't it, the power to direct the activities. Okay. Uh, and if that's the case, you can pass an ordinary resolution, can't we? And if we can pass an ordinary resolution within that subsidiary, then we can appoint the directors of that subsidiary and we will appoint our directors and we can tell those directors what to do. Uh, if that's the case, then we have the power to direct and therefore the power to be able to exert control, don't we? Uh, when we were there at the days of F7, wasn't it? Uh, it was deemed that we had control if we own greater than 50% of the equity share capital. Uh, here specifically, it's going through there. And what you have to think about now is not necessarily the equity share capital, but 50% of, of the voting rights. Because if you have greater than 50% of the voting rights, that goes through there, doesn't it? And gives you the right to pass an ordinary resolution. Now, as we said, with that ordinary resolution, you can appoint the directors, okay? Uh, excellent. So you have control if you have the power to direct the activities and that is deemed if you have greater than 50% of the voting rights. Uh, if that was the case, then what we went through and did there is we looked at the concept, was it of substance over legal form? So you had the parent and the subsidiary. They are two separate legal entities, aren't they? They have their own certificate of incorporation that they will file, uh, which shows that they exist legally by, the, by themselves. But because the parent has control over that subsidiary, we will go through there and treat it uh, as one group entity, isn't it? OK, uh, so remember, you, you cannot sue a group, can you? You have to sue the individual entity, whether that's the parent or the subsidiary. And we are accounting for the substance, the economic reality, aren't we? The economic reality being that the parent shareholders own 100 percent of the parents, but they also have control, don't they, over that subsidiary? So in effect, have ownership of that subsidiary and it's therefore one big group of companies, isn't it? OK, uh, and then the key bit, I suppose, we went through and prepared the group accounts within F7 was looking at that concept of control and ownership, wasn't it? Uh, can you remember how we showed control within the statement of financial position and the statement of profit or loss and OCI? Can you control was showed by? Yeah, that's it. Uh, we went through there, didn't we, and added across 100% of the parent, 100% of the subsidiary, assets, liabilities, income, expenditure. And we did that on a line by line basis, wasn't it? So we took all of P, all of S, provided that we had control, wasn't it? However, we had that issue, didn't we, if we had control. So we own greater than 50% of the voting rights, but we did not have full 100% ownership. So if we own 75% of the subsidiary, there was that 25% non-controlling interest, wasn't it? And what we had to do is we had to show that non-controlling interest within the equity section of the statement of financial position, whereby we had to look at what the non-controlling interest owned at acquisition and looked at what they had owned post-acquisition of the movement in the net assets. 
whereby in the statement of profit or loss, we consolidated 100% of S's profits, hadn't we? And we needed to show what the non-controlling interest owned of S's profits for the year. Okay, everything else was then owned by the parent, wasn't it? If that's a little bit unfamiliar, uh, don't panic. We will go through and recap it in a lot more detail as we work through the rest of the chapter a little bit later on. Okay, uh, just be aware. And um, what I will go through and do is I would suggest that you do learn it. Uh, because yes, question one in the exam is highly computational uh, with regards to the 35 marks based around groups. Uh, there are individual accounting standards examined as well. It's not primarily just a group accounts question, uh, but groups can also appear in question two, question three, uh, whereby what you have there is it's more of a discursive based question and ask you to apply the specific rule to a given scenario and explain the justification of your accounting treatment. So within question one, simply you, you will own greater than 50% of the voting rights or 50% of the equity share capital of the subsidiary to demonstrate control. However, what happens if maybe we own 45 or 49%? It's very close to having control. So are there other situations whereby essentially you could gain control without having just 50% of the voting rights okay so you've got some situations here which you would need to potentially go through and learn for the exam okay as the first one it backs up the 50 percent of the voting rights so if you have the majority of the voting rights you have a majority don't you if you have greater than 50 percent okay however let's just say that you own 45 49 percent but if you have a contractual arrangement, OK, with, with the other shareholders so the people who own the remaining 51 or the remaining 55 percent. And if there is a contractual agreement between the parties that say you have the controlling vote, that then you go through there and are exercising your power to direct the activity. So therefore have control through that contractual arrangement, even though you may not own greater than 50 percent. OK. Uh, the other situation that you've got there, similar in that you have less than 50% of the voting rights, but there is not a contractual arrangement in place. But the remainder of the shares are very, very widely distributed. So uh, that there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of shareholders that own a very small proportion of that entity. If that's the case, it would be very difficult for all those widely distributed voting rights to be brought together to vote against you okay so therefore if you hold a bit less than 50 percent but the rest of the shares and the voting rights are widely distributed then you are still deemed to go through there and have control okay uh, and then the other situation is that you have potential voting rights so maybe you have a significant ownership percentage and that at some point in the future you are able to convert maybe your convertible debentures into ordinary shares, which will give you additional voting rights in the future. If that's the case, the standards go through there and take the view, and correctly so, that you will exercise the debenture and convert it into shares because it's a cheaper way of acquiring your shares, isn't it? So therefore, in the future, we will have control. So let's deem that we have control today. Okay, and now none of those situations are likely to crop up within the first part of question one. Uh, it's just going to be a simple exercise of working that you have more than 50% of the shares. Uh, but from the discursive aspect, maybe in part B of question one or maybe one of the, the sections within question two or three could ask you to discuss any one of those situations there. OK, so I will go through there and learn them and commit them to memory. OK, if we then move it on in terms of looking at an associate. OK. If we have a look there at the associate, remember an associate was whereby we were deemed to have not controllable but significant influence, isn't it? Okay, and significant influence is the power to participate. Okay, so you, you can't direct the activities, you can't say this is what the entity has to do, uh, you can't put in place your directors, but you can participate, you can be heard, or if you like, you can be a little bit of an irritant. Okay. Yeah, you have some ownership interest within the business, you have some voting rights, you have a right to attend meetings and cast your vote and you can put across your thoughts, your opinions. 
You know, your thoughts and opinions may not be actually exercised, but you're you're irritating the, the rest of the, the meeting by putting across those opinions. You are being heard by everybody else. So you, you may have a little bit of an influence depending upon how well you put across your arguments. OK, so if we have significant influence, the key is that you have the power to participate in the operating and financial decision making. Again, in F7, it was deemed if we had influence, it would be because we own somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of the equity share capital. OK. Again, from a question one, part A perspective, highly computational, you will just work out that you have 25% of an entity and therefore it is an associate, okay, not nothing else to it. However, that again, like we saw a moment ago with your subsidiary, there could be situations where you own less than 20%, but you still have influence, okay, the 20 to 50% isn't a guarantee of usually as a guarantee of influence, but what happens if you own a little bit less, okay? That could still give you influence, provided that you have any of the following criteria. So again, I would learn it, okay? I would write it out, I would copy it out on a separate page of notes, make yourself some revision notes if you so wish, uh, to, to learn the other situations whereby influence exists, okay? Uh, first one that you've got there, is that you have reputation or representation on the board. So maybe there are 10 directors. Uh, maybe you have two or three of those directors. So again, you have the right uh, to attend the annual general meetings. You have the right to attend the board meetings and you can participate, can't you? You have the ability to, to, to talk and put your opinions across at the board meeting. So even if you own less than 20%, but you have representation on the board, you are participating, aren't we? Again, if you have participation in the policy making process, so looking at your accounting policies and going through there and looking at your, your strategic decision making policies, if you can participate in that, maybe through some form of management role, uh, then again, you have the power to participate, don't we? Uh, the other significant scenario is if there are material transactions. So if there are material transactions that are taking place between yourself and the investee, so essentially what will now be the associate, then the reason why there are material transactions is essentially because you have been exerting your influence, haven't you? The other scenario is if there is interchange of managerial personnel. So if you have provided some management to the investee, uh, they are going to participate, aren't they? Because they are going to have influence over the financial and the operating policy decisions that are being made because they are your management and you have put them in place so you can tell them what to do essentially. And then finally, maybe you've gone through there and given some essential technical information. Uh, so there's been a particularly technical aspect of the business, whether that's there to do with raising finance, or maybe that's there a big technical issue to do with the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Then if you've helped them out with that, then again, that's showing that you are using your influence, aren't you? Okay. So again, do go through, try to learn them. Uh, but usually when you see exam questions, that they do tend to push you into the right method of thinking that helps you recall uh, those situations whereby control exists and significant influence may also exist. So let's just go through, uh, have a look at the example, which is called influence. It's a little bit of a giveaway. I apologize. Uh, but just to bring this little session to a close before we then start to look at the statement of financial position and then the statement of profit or loss. But what you've got here is an example, as we said, called influence. And it's not numerical. So it says here, advise Vader how it should account for the investment in REN uh, in its financial statements. OK, so it's all about offering advice. It's put it's you putting yourself out there as a, as a fully qualified accountant, being paid for your worldly knowledge and being asked the reasons why you would go through and adopt the accounting treatment that you have proposed. So here, you've got Vader acquired 19.9%. So you're so close to that cusp, aren't we, of 20% and, and that 19.9% then being, if you like, giving you influence over rent. But 19.9%, it's not 20, is it? Okay, so maybe there is influence, maybe there isn't influence. So we bought that 19.9% at the start of the year. 
as part of the investment. Vader has two out of the eight seats on the board of directors. Okay, so you now have representation on the board. Uh, you don't have control, do we? Okay, so you don't have enough to be able to go through there and, and control what happens within the board of directors with, with two. But I think those two directors do have the ability to participate in the operating and financial decision making policies, don't they? Okay, yeah, they can go there and attend the board meetings. They can talk about the appropriate methods of finance that they believe are the most beneficial to the company. They can talk about the best strategic decisions with regards to the day to day operations of the business. So although they are not controlling, they, they, they are participating, aren't they? And even though we only have 19.9%, because of that representation on the board, we do have influence, don't we? So therefore, what you would have there is that your company rent would therefore be an associate, wouldn't it? And if you have an associate, the accounting that you are going to adopt, is equity accounting okay i'm not going to go into the detail about the equity accounting just yet but you will be expected to within the exam okay uh so within the exam once you've explained why you believe it is an associate and then because it is an associate you are going to go through their equity account you would then need to go through there and show how to equity account for it on the statement of profit or loss so that's just one line item isn't it your investment and associates and also the what would happen in your statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. So remember, again, it's just one line item, share of profit of associate immediately before profit, before tax in profit or loss. And is it there your share of other comprehensive income of associate within the OCI at the bottom of your statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income? Uh, if you're interested, and we'll touch upon it later on, uh, whenever you're looking at an associate, you're always accounting for equity accounting based on your share. So here we base it upon a 19.9% holding. OK, so it's just demonstrating here that you don't have to have the 20%. Yeah, you could have slightly less than 20%, but still have the power to participate. And I really like that question there because it just starts to very early on within the videos, introduce you to what you could see in the, the non-computational aspects of the exam okay uh, we'll build upon that as we go through later on but other than that hopefully uh, you're happy there now with, with your brief introduction in terms of what control is what influence is before in the next section we go through there and begin to look at the consolidated statement of financial position so i'll see you all in a moment